Well, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. And it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Gang Han. He works at the upstream of Aramco Americas with over 25 years of experience in rock mechanics and geomechanics. He focuses on the technologies related to rock characterization, in situ stress, hydraulic fracturing, well planning and construction, reservoir performance and well productivity. Prior to joining Aramco, Dr. Han worked offshore, continental, and unconventional reservoirs from the Middle East, Gulf of Mexico, continental USA, North, North Sea, Southeast and East Asia, Australia, North and West Africa, and South America. He is the current president of the, the American Rock Mechanics Association, and as the chair of the ARMA Technical Committee on Hydraulic Fracturing, he is the founder and the chair of the Hydraulic Fracturing Community with over a thousand professionals representing 335 global organizations. With over 55 publications in geomechanics, he is regularly invited to give keynotes at professional meetings and societies such as ARMA, SPE, AAPG, SEG, and ERTEC. He is a leading author of a multi-industry book, Drilling in Extreme Environments, Penetration and Sampling on Earth and Other Planets. He holds a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Waterloo in Canada. And with that, I am honored to introduce our guest today, Dr. Hahn, and I will let you take the reins. And then after the presentation, we will open it up for questions and answers. And I will let you take it from here. All right. Thank you, Molly, uh, for the introduction. And thanks everyone for being available attend to this uh, session, the P, uh, PSGD AEPG session. Uh, I always use this uh, as my start uh, uh, cracking joke. So when Molly introduced me, hey, she pronounced my name perfectly as a standard pronunciation. Uh, my first name, uh, Gan. But since I'm not the bad guy, the pronunciation is actually Gong. Uh, in Chinese, that means a small hill. Uh, <laughs> so that's always my punchline, uh, Molly. <laughs> As I mentioned, I keep a few minutes uh, uh, to to uh, let this uh, joke rooting out. So today I wear two hats. I want to share with you uh, these two um, aspects, if you will. Uh, one is uh, one hat. I'm the current president of uh, American Rock Mechanics Association. Uh, the other hat is, uh, as Molly mentioned, I'm also uh, uh, I work at Aramco Americas upstream uh, with uh, Geosense team. Um, and uh, for the first hat, <laughs> American Rock Mechanics Association, I just want to uh, uh, highlight a, a couple of things, uh, uh, two or three slides. Who we are, um, AMA is established in 1995 from US National Committee for Rock Mechanics, National Ac uh, Academy of Science, Sciences. Our mission is to be the worldwide uh, recognized representation of multidisciplinary rock mechanics advancements and uh, applications to serve its members and the public. We have about uh, 1,000 members uh, in petroleum, civil, mining, geothermal, and interdiscipline. Uh, and about 50 members right now uh, from uh, outside of the US, similar to AEPG, uh, become a global organization. And 30% of our members are students, uh, including 15 uh, student chapters. So what do we do? Um, number one, we hold the annual conference, uh, which is called the U.S. Rock Mechanics Geomechanics Symposium. Many of you actually uh, uh, actively participate in uh, this uh, uh, great uh, series, including the, the one that just finished the virtual, the first ever virtual U.S. Rock Mechanics Symposium. Uh, then the second, we organize international 
meetings I will highlight my next uh, partner with AEPG uh, and other societies. Uh, also short courses, topical forums, workshop. Uh, at ARM, we have uh, uh, several uh, important technical committees. For instance, technical committee on hydraulic fracturing, uh, induced seismicity, uh, drilling, and underground storage and utilization. Uh, that is our newest technical committee includes including the CO2 sequestration and the energy storage. Uh, then we have technical committee on turnouting as well. Uh, we support and encourage students and early career participations. Uh, we issue awards uh, in research category, applied research, uh, case history, PhD and master thesis, outstanding contribution and distinguished services. Many, several of you I noticed in the audience actually, are the recipients for uh, uh, of those uh, awards. Congratulations, thank you for uh, great work and the contributions too. Um, then we publish AMA letters, maintain the AMA digital library at Vampetro. Uh, we also uh, affiliate a member of the International Society of Rock Mechanics. Uh, this is the last slide for the AMA. Uh, this is the upcoming conference that partnered with uh, the Huron Geoscience Society, Society of Exploration uh, Geophysics, and uh, endorsed by AEPG uh, and uh, SPWLA, is multi society efforts uh, for 2021 International Geomechanics Symposium. Uh, it will be held in November 1st to 4th uh, as a virtual. Um, we just announced the technical program is representing 50 global organizations and the technical sessions if you look at the technical sessions it's very interesting because geomechanics right so you have geo uh, at the first and then you have mechanics at the second if you look at the uh, technical sessions the first four topics in situ stress rock faults and natural fresh fractures are the geo part. And then the second part, drilling, completion, stimulation, field cases, AI, more or less are related to engineering. And of course, we're gonna talk about the new uh, applications such as uh, uh, CO2 sequestration, geothermal and uh, energy storage as well. Um, uh, one highlight of the conference is that the training with fellows. So we're going to provide a one-day training opportunity with uh, MIT professor Herbert Einstein on the geothermal, professor Mark Zobeck from Stanford on CO2 sequestration, as well as John McLennan of University of Utah, um, the PI uh, of the Forge project, geothermal Forge project, talk about the treaty. Okay, so those are fantastic program and we wish uh, uh, some of the you uh, can join us and have fun and uh, just look up uh, the website for more details. That's uh, one hat I wear. <laughs> then I move on to my second hat, which is a topic, uh, technical talk that uh, uh, we're going to uh, discuss today. I want to share with you uh, some of the studies we have done uh, in terms of stress sensitivity sensitivity of fractured tight reservoirs. Each word has its significant meaning by itself. Um, and this um, outline first introduce what is rock stress sensitivity. We're gonna look at this term from flow, acoustic and a mechanical properties perspectives. And then we look at uh, what this stress sensitive stress sensitivity influence on production on EUR. And we first talk about the geo, second talk about the mechanics. Okay. Um, compaction of the unconventional rock with increase of confining stress. The compaction is going to be analyzed through mechanical behavior of the rock that is stress-strain curve, acoustic velocities, 
and the permeability. Those three components uh, demonstrate the rock compaction. Besides rock, we're also going to look at the stress sensitivity of the fractures. There are two types of fractures, a tensile fracture, mode one, uh, mimic, for instance, hydraulic fractures. Um, and the second shear fracture, mode two, uh, mimic the natural fractures. Then we're gonna tie the rock and the fracture sen stress sensitivity to the drawdown management. And we're gonna figure out why some whale, some whales uh, decline, the production decline pretty rapidly, especially at the beginning. So eventually it's a trade-off between the production and the ultimate recovery. Uh, we're gonna provide some conclusions in the end as well. First, let's take a look at the, what is uh, stress sensitivity for the rock. We all understand the rock is stress sensitive, is stress dependent. With increasing of stresses, confining stresses, to the left, you will see uh, this uh, curve represents the porosity or the permeability on the y-axis, the decline with the confining stress on the x-axis. There is a pretty distinguished, uh, first of all, they decline pretty significantly, right? Second, um, there is a, a slope change, significant slope change between these two uh, lines. In literature, people reported up from 10 to almost 99% totally loss of permeability or porosity because of uh, increase of confining stress. So that's very significant. Um, that rock sample that you are looking at, um, you can look up the details of this test uh, from this paper, is actually uh, one of the bucking rock. Besides the permeability decrease, we also find the acoustic velocities increase with confining stress uh, uh, increase. That means that the rock become tighter and the, the acoustic passing through quicker, right? However, the, apparently there is a plateau. So once you reach the acoustic velocities, reach certain plateau is actually flattened out. So the three different curves represent three different uh, uh, orientation of the plaques. The Young's modulars and the strings uh, all depend on, in situ, on the confining stress. When the stress, confining stress become uh, higher, each curve represents uh, elevation of the confining stress from zero PSI to 5,000 PSI. This is unconfined, this is 5,000 PSI. As you can see, the rock become tighter and the modulars become larger as you increase confining stress. And more interestingly, as confining stress increase, the rock become less brittle and more ductile. Okay. Of course, the anisotropic uh, rock anisotropic will decrease too with uh, confining stress. The unconventional rocks uh, are, to are different animals, right? So we all realize unconventional. This term by itself is unique. So some of the Unconventional rocks, as uh, showed in this uh, slide already, are stress sensitive. Even though this rock has 10,000 uh, PSI strings, they are very strong, but they still sensitive to the rock, uh, to the, the stress. Why is that? Number one, the unconventional rock has uh, carrying clay and carbonate minerals abundant. Those minerals are all uh, all have low modular. Second, unconventional rock has high TOC, total orga organic contents. That's very soft. Third, often people uh, 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 miss this point, is in the unconventional, most prolific wells are normally in the fuse with uh, overpressure. Formation is overpressured. Overpressure pressure lead to separation of the grains during the compaction stage, consolidation stage. 
therefore the green green contact is uh, is uh, much less than the conventional counterparts so that's the third component all three components lead to higher compressible rock matrix in unconventional as as well as lower permeability so drawdown oh, we, rock is uh, uh, stress sensitive and how about why it matters why does it matter because it has everything to do with production and uh, recovery that's why it is so important that's why everything starts from the rock um, the drawdown for instance increase with the effective uh, loading uh, data p when you lower put a drawdown on uh, rock you increase the data p when you increase the pressure difference the drawdown then you increase the loading to the left um, on the rock as uh, effective stress defined as a total stress minus power pressure so the power pressure decrease and then the loading increase this is the only equation by the way i have in this presentation so no sweat excessive loading leads rock into many changes for example the permeability reduction in the rock matrix natural features and hydraulic features and the loss of uh, fracture conductivity, prop and embedment and crushing, fence migration, formation spalling, and the rock compaction, especially when the rock compaction reach a stage feel the rock. Uh, that's what we're going to show today. Excessive loading ties to aggressive drawdown. The gr aggressive drawdown uh, in this plot, for instance, uh, is uh, uh, production versus a drawdown as you can see the production actually decreased pretty significantly once you change the choke if you open the well aggressively uh, with a higher drawdown your rock will respond that response leads to this sharp decline of the production and the loss of uh, recovery in some of the cases if the deformation of the rock is irreversible. This phenomena is not new. People have uh, familiar, especially operators have been familiar with this phenomena for so many years, since the beginning of the unconventional production priority. Um, over the years, operators find in many different fields, um, they, they have experienced this uh, challenge for instance, Devon found out in Eagleford, uh, if they um, manage the drawdown without the opening the choke all the way, uh, based on 450 wells they surveyed, they studied, they can achieve 100% and 87% increase of 30 day and 60 days accumulated production. Molly, you work for Devon. This is from the data from Devon publications. Um, then Shell in Hansville found out uh, if they manage the uh, production drawdown properly, they can lift the re ultimate recovery by 38%. You can look up the reference uh, to the right. Uh, Murphy in Mountney found uh, the many drawdown, uh, not only uh, lift the EUR by 36%, but also reduce the liquid loading and uh, the, the sand production after fracturing, the propane production has disappeared. Chevron in the Permian Midland found uh, a stable uh, reservoir pressure and less water and sand production with uh, managed drawdown as well. Council in Utica, Point Pleasant, and found 30% uh, the EUR lift again similar to other uh, operators and they are the, uh, each well that they put the managed uh, drawdown uh, on uh, can achieve thir 13 to 20 million uh, scrap per day production that's pretty impressive and the vpf 
in Argentina find that to save 20% UR, but simply manage their uh, production drawdown. So this is clearly demonstrate why the rock matters, why you need to do this. So in the next few slides, I will uh, share with you uh, uh, a series of rock test results from uh, this uh, uh, very tight uh, rock with abundant uh, laminations. The two photos you see over here are the rock samples, x-ray sample and photos. And uh, the top is pre-test, the bottom is after test, and you can see clearly there is a fracture developed after test, um, crush the rock basically. And the left rock has less laminations, the right uh, rock sample has abundant laminations. Um, so in general, this rock has 6% porosity. Again, the rock strength is uh, 10,000 PSI, very high. And we're going to talk about the mechanical, flu, and acoustic measurements with increase of confining stress. I give away the conclusion first. <laughs> Let me dive into the details. Uh, many rock samples we tested have experienced the power collapse phenomena. That's very eye-opening. For 10,000 PSI rock strings, those rock samples still experienced power collapse. And the porosity has reduced from 6% to 4.5% before after test, while the matrix permeability declined 90%. What does that mean? That means 1.5% of porosity decline leads to 90% permeability loss. Isn't that mind blowing? And uh, the details of this test, you can look up the uh, publication, this paper, IPTC 2260. Uh, uh, so first let's look at the evidence from the mechanical behavior of the rock, uh, how the power collapse happened. This is a typical stress strain curve for any rock mechanics test you be familiar with, right? So you load the rock, the, X, you know, the volumetric strain increase, uh, the dashed line is a volumetric strain, the uh, solid line is axial strain. When the, as the strain increase, when you reach certain point, the rock starts dilating. That's what we call dilation. This is a compaction, this is a dilation. This is a typical rock behavior from this, uh, not only unconventional, but also more so for conventional. So this sample follow the tradition. Look at this sample. And the volumetric strain increase for the first, but never into went to the dilation stage. So the volumetric, volumetric speaking, the rock keep shrinking, keep compacting. So this is what this rock sample looks like. So that indicates power collapse. Okay, when you uh, keep uh, squeezing the rock without the dilating dilation, the rock compaction. Uh, keep compacting, so that's uh, power collapse. Acoustically, after you compact the rock more and more, for instance, this is a horizontal plug, and this is at 2000 PSI confining stress, uh, acoustic velocity as musically around the rock. So as you can see, this at 2000 PSI, the magnitude the, uh, of the velocity is indicated by the diameter of uh, those uh, circles. Compared to 4,000 PSI, this is 2,000, this is 4,000, you can see the rock getting compacted and the velocity increase. Okay, this is clear. However, 
when we go to 8,000 PSI confining, the velocity actually decrease instead of increase. In, instead of getting uh, denser or more compacted, let the acoustic wave pass through quickly. Now the acoustic wave fan itself have difficulties passing through because the rock pole has have collapsed. Then look at the vertical plugs. The previous is the horizontal plug. This is the vertical plug. Again, 2000 PSI, confining stress. The diameter of those rings represents as musical velocity magnitude. And this is 2000, this is the 4000. Again, you see this increase of velocity when you compact, the rock is compacted. And next 8000 PSI, it's not increasing anymore. It's not decreasing either, not significantly. I will explain why next. So acoustically, mechanically, we all have found out through the rock sample, uh, rock test, unconventional rock with 10,000 PSI can experience power class compaction. Now let's look at the permeability the flow properties, how this uh, rock behave in terms of uh, permeability uh, during this uh, power collapse process. So on the x-axis is the uh, effective confining stress. On the y-axis left is uh, normalized uh, matrix of permeability. Okay, and uh, on the uh, right uh, y-axis is the ratio of horizontal to vertical permeability basically permeability and it's choppy. So as you can see, the curve uh, is to the left, uh, is a permeability of the matrix and both horizontal perm and the vertical perm, horizontal in red, vertical perm in black, are uh, declining rapidly with uh, increase of confining stress. That's number one. Number two, the horizontal permeability is much higher than the vertical permeability uh, because of these laminations. And uh, horizontal perm, however, start with high, but uh, is actually decrease a lot of faster than the vertical ones. Therefore, it's more sensitive. And there is a distinguished distinctive slope change in both horizontal and vertical perm at around 2,300 PSI. So this stress, I will mention several times this stress value because this is a critical stress trigger the power collapse of the rock. And in terms of anisotropic, the vertical, uh, to horizontal to vertical permeability ratio, this two bar clearly shows that the ratio at the beginning is very high with horizontal permeability is almost, uh, uh, is one, or, one order magnitude higher than the vertical. But as the rock confining stress uh, increase, the rock is compacted. Now after 2300 PSI, these two permeability, horizontal, vertical, are close to each other. They are very close to each other. So anisotropy disappears with increase of confining stress. So this 2,300 is a magic number for this rock that uh, triggers, has triggered power class. Why? Why such a strong rock, 10,000 PSI? That means the rock can afford 10,000 PSI on its shoulder, right? Why the rock, the pole can collapse at 2,300 PSI? That's amazing, is it? So the fundamentally, the reason lies in this plot. Everyone familiar with this is the Coulomb plot. Right, so the normal stress to the uh, x-axis, where x-axis is the shear stress. Typically, the rock behaves 
like this uh, black line. You, the, the line indicates the shear strength. And then at a certain point, when the compaction cap start to play a role, if you keep compacting the rock, so the rock may collapse, the pole collapse. This is a typical conventional rock behavior. However, for unconventional rock, very often you find out for unconventional rock, you have a higher friction angle. This high friction angle leads to higher strength value in the axial compressive strength in the red. The red plus is uh, for unconventional rock, red curves. This unconventional rock strength, UCS number two, is actually a lot of higher than the conventional rock, which a few thousand PSI, in our case is 10,000 PSI for unconventional rock. However, look at the compaction strength, the compaction cap, cap the limit that the trigger the call collapse, collapse is much smaller, lower value than the um, conventional rock. So eventually the fundamental reason is a friction angle. Okay, high friction angle, low modulars, as uh, we discussed earlier, uh, very soft material, high TUC components. And the deformable green because uh, the excessive uh, overpressure and the weak green green contacts. So compaction failure leads to loss of porosity and permeability and decline of production and the recovery. Everything fundamentally roots in this uh, Mercoulon plot. Okay, this is uh, the basis. This is after test unconventional rock, the pore collapse, the sample, what it looked like. In comparison, this is a conventional rock, pore collapse, after pore collapse, uh, exceed the compaction cap. You can look up more details about this conventional rock from this uh, SP paper uh, we published a while ago. So both conventional, the message is very clear, both conventional and unconventional rocks can experience power collapse and the rock compaction. So much for rock. Next few slides, we're going to talk about the fractures, right? How fracture behave when the confining stress increase? When we talk about fractures, stress sensitivity of the fractures, we talk about two types of fractures. One is the mode one hydraulic fracture, uh, tensile fracture, mimic hydraulic fractures. Second is mode two shear fractures, uh, or mode three as well, that mimic natural fracture slippage when you stimulate in the veil. So hydraulic fracture, this is uh, the test on uh, hydraulic fracture sensitivity with uh, uh, confining stress. Hydraulic fracture is tensile at the lab. To create this uh, tensile stress, we basically applied uh, a Brazilian test, uh, created these tensile fractures. Uh, if you can see my mouse, um, the, this top and the bottom line are the laminations of the rock sample, come with rock sample, and this a uh, perpendicular uh, line, black line, is uh, the fracture we introduced to the rock as if it is a hydraulic fractures. Interestingly, this uh, induced the fracture stop at the boundary of uh, these uh, uh, two laminations. That indicates the rule of the laminations in the fracture propagation. Can be a showstopper, okay? And uh, at a different confining stress, we measure how this uh, stress uh, fracture permeability behaves. Besides uh, tensile fracture, we also look at the shear fractures. How we create the shear fracture in the lab, we use the direct shear test where you basically slide 
the Fed, you please to steal plates on both ends of the sample. And with confining stress, you apply the load to shear this sample and create direct shear uh, movement um, to introduce the shear fractures. And the conductivity is measured on the different confining stress, which indicated uh, in this uh, plot, the yellow line. So this is the before the test. Uh, this is the shear fracture. Uh, this is the uh, uh, shear fracture we created through the direct test. A very nice, beautiful fracture. And uh, this is the before test, this is the after test, what the sample looked like. Now look at the results. Effective confining stress on the x-axis, where x-axis is the normalized permeability. The permeability uh, value divided by the original uh, sample permeability. As you can see, the, uh, the red line is for shear fractures. The black line is for tensile fractures. Okay, uh, photos after test look like this. So for unpropped tensile fracks, okay, this tensile fractures, its permeability is lost uh, almost uh, 90% with uh, 4,000 PSI increase of confining stress. Okay. By 4,000 PSI, 90% of uh, hydraulic fracture or induced fracture permeability gone, disappeared. In comparison, shear fractures are more resistant to closing stress and retained 30% of initial permeability. Instead of 10% for tensile fractures, no shear fractures can return 30% of its permeability with the same confining stress levels. So both shear and uh, tensile fractures Interesting, share the same critical confining stress value we keep talking about, 2,300 PSI, a distinguished decline slope change before and after. This plot also interesting uh, because it indicates the production from SRV, People keep talking about stimulated reservoir volume, why it matters, because the shear fractures actually can retain 30% of their permeability values in the SRV after you, uh, even with confining stress, okay? So that's why shear fracture of natural fracture is so important for both EUR and the critical drawdown of production. In the first slide, you already saw uh, what operator uh, have benefited from managing uh, drawdown, basically managing the critical loading on rock near available, right? So different operators. So exactly what did they do? The best practices. This is where a lot of people find uh, very practical and they can use in their fields too. But keep in mind, those operators through uh, trial and error find those uh, practice, best practices based on their fields, their rock. Your rock may be different. So that's why this, those references may not be applicable to your fields. It's pretty dangerous if you just borrow those numbers and apply directly to, the, to your veil. Disclaimer, uh, Gang Han didn't say you can use those numbers. You better be careful, <laughs> be cautious, okay? So for instance, uh, uh, Devin through talk management with, with a high frequency data, that's a key, high frequency monitoring data. They successfully did uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, achieved the benefit. Shell used restricted flowback, limit the flowback amount, and uh, Murphy used uh, downhole 
choke management instead of surface uh, choke management. And the Chevron uh, in Permian, they use the one to five PSI per hour drawdown rate um, instead of uh, a much faster rate a lot of other operators use. A console, for instance, they use uh, uh, 15 to 25 PSI per day drawdown. Uh, that's similar about uh, one to two uh, PSI, less than one PSI uh, per hour uh, drawdown rate. VPF uh, drawdown rate vary from 0 0.5 to 5 a quarter to 2 PSI per hour. They also optimize the timing of the choke management. So the timing, when you adjust the, the choke, become critical too. So those are all best practices to clearly demonstrate operators can benefit from the choke management by understanding fundamental uh, rock behaviors. So here's my conclusions. The tested uh, unconventional rock, even though with high strength, shows high risk of compaction failure. 2,300 PSI already can collapse the rock. And regardless, it's high strength. And we we confirmed this from as mutual acoustic profile, from mechanical behavior of the rock, from stress dependent uh, permeability. Uh, keep in mind, 90% of permeability gone with only 1% of porosity change. Um, for the fractures, tensile and the shear fractures are highly sensitive. Uh, sensitive to effective stress. For laminated rock, high permeability um, um, and it's choppy disappears at the high, higher uh, confining stress. Comparing to shear fractures, tensile fractures have a higher initial permeability, but uh, not sustainable. Those permeability gone very quickly with uh, confining stress. That's why propane is so important. Okay. However, the stimulated volume outside the tensile fractures, the shear fracture is a key, the probability is a key for production. Both tensile and the shear fractures decline similarly with two distinguished, uh, distinct stages. A fast decline at the beginning, which is elastic and the fracture close, and then steady decline with a pore collapse irreversible deformation. And the shear fractures, as I mentioned, from bedding uh, slippage and lamination slippage, uh, false natural fractures, so on, mechanical discontinuities uh, will determine the long-term production, not the hydraulic fractures. The rapid initial rate decline can result from closure of shear and tensile fractures, managed drawdown is required for stress sensitive unconventional reservoirs, especially the reservoirs with over pressure. Okay, if your reservoir is over pressured, you better let your management know <laughs> this phenomena is coming sooner or later, if not already. With that, I need to acknowledge um, APG PSGD um, invite me to share this uh, study with you. Uh, appreciate uh, Aramco Americas and Saudi Aramco for allowing this publication and the technical supports and the discussions from Metarock Laboratory are uh, critical to those uh, uh, findings as well. If you have any questions, regard, regard, regardless is for AMA as a general, how rock mechanics or geomechanics can get better. All for this technical presentation study itself, feel free to send me an email uh, with the email address on this. With that, I'm open for any questions you might have. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thanks, uh, Molly. Thank you so much. That's a very valuable information. I know that there's a lot of operators out there that will benefit from this information and 
seeing the work that you guys have been doing. Um, there are some questions that are coming through on the chat. There's also a Q&A box if anyone wants to type anything in there. But would you like me to read those questions from the chat or are you able to see those on your own? I'm happy uh, to hear I will, I will go directly actually. I, I am able to read those chat uh, uh, directly. Uh, but uh, uh, if I miss any, uh, Molly, feel free to, to uh, uh, help me out. Uh, I see Ed ask a question, uh, slide number 10. Uh, let me go back to slide number 10. Ed, thanks for attending this. Slide number 10, what was the in-situ confining stress before field call uh, extraction? Okay, uh, Ed, I know uh, this study, uh, we sanitize uh, heavily as we all understand, in order to publish. Any field specific information uh, is, uh, is not uh, uh, indicated in this paper. But I can tell you this, the stress value we used in the lab, which you saw on the X axis, are the similar stress value that we are talking about or expect the rock experience from the field. Hopefully I answer your question. I still keep my job, okay. <laughs> uh, second question uh, from Suraj uh, Kumar. Is, any, uh, is there any hydrostatic test done on this sample? And what is perm of this uh, rock in terms of uh, Darcy, uh, Darcy unit? Yeah, again, uh, as you can see, the value, absolute value of this rock is uh, not there. We provide a relative value. Uh, for particular reason, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, however, we did do hydrostatic test on uh, the samples first before we apply the confining stress, then apply increase the uh, axial stress. As a matter of fact, every sample, every confining stress, we load the sample first to the confining stress, for instance, the 2000 PSI, and then you keep increasing the axial loading until you see this pore collapse phenomena. The maximum stress value we reached is 1000 PSI, then we realize that's a little bit too much. So uh, on the uh, later uh, half of the samples we tested, we usually maintained around five to 6000 PSI, uh, maximum effective loading, uh, differential stress, if you will, confining stress. So, uh, Peter, uh, Peter Wong asks, shear fetchers make most of SRV, what, uh, which makes a lot of things, thanks. Many people think that most shear fetchers are not really open, just the pop pressure increase in the uh, uh, shear fetchers. Do you agree? From this study, apparently, we found that the probability, 30% of probability can be written in the shear fetcher. Okay, those are by the uh, nature, nature uh, irregularity surface that uh, created along the uh, natural fracture or bedding planes or whatever falls. Um, so those, those values are going to be there. Uh, that's at least for this rock. Okay, disclaimer, uh, for other rocks, you need to do similar tests and find out if in your case, that's uh, still apply. I wouldn't rule out some of the rock, the shear fetchers may not contribute as much as uh, ours in this case. Uh, Gary, ask Gary, thanks for, for the question. What formations did you use for the unconventional rock test? And do you consider it a representative most uh, uh, unconventional reservoirs? Again, I couldn't uh, uh, tell the name of the uh, uh, field. Uh, but I can tell you this, uh, each unconventional field, you know much better, Gary, you know much better than me. Each unconventional field is unique. The rock is unique. So over this past decade of experience with unconventional, all of us agree. We disagree on many things, but the one thing we agree, uh, I think most of the people agree, <laughs> absolute value, but uh, 
Uh, one thing most people agree is each, each field should be treated uh, separately or uniquely. Therefore, uh, I wouldn't uh, say my results can apply or representative to other fields. However, the methodology, the test program that we put together, which you can look up the uh, details in that IPTC paper, that package is available. You can basically apply the same package to your field, to the rock you are interested in, to see if those findings are applicable um, at all, if you are. Um, but again, it's a field specific, very good point. Uh, Prasad, uh, thanks, uh, good to see you here. Are there any experimental study to prove the point that the probability increases when the anisotropic stress increases? This phenomena is due to dilating fracture on the shear fracture can be numerically simulated. Yeah, uh, I, I agree. Uh, this, as I mentioned, the test showed uh, so far are static, right? So there is no injection, there is no st dynamic slippage as you apply the uh, confining stress. Uh, as a matter of fact, in the field, as you uh, rightfully pointed out, um, this anisotropic, regardless of probability or mechanical properties, uh, can increase if the, the slippage occurred during the stimulation process. Um, so this study, uh, is mainly for static rock. Uh, that's why we induce the hydraulic fracture <laughs> by literally breaking apart <laughs> um, and also induce the slippage by literally shear the uh, rock itself. So good point, thank you. Um, what other evidence do you have from Ed again? What other evidence do you have that uh, shear fracture determine long-term production. Um, there are many, actually, Ed, you know much better than me in this regard. I have to, uh, uh, many people actually have published many articles in this regard. I know some of the fields may not see as much significance as others, but uh, it's quite uh, uh, often, you see from the literature, people reported this uh, stimulated rock volume. Uh, the probability of that stimulated rock volume is uh, way higher than the in situ rock matrix probability. If you want to match the production from the um, uh, production data, then you have to artificially bump up your rock probability from that stimulated volume by um, one or two order magnitude higher. I think this uh, uh, call test have shown at least a uh, partial reason why that happens. Stress sensitivity and the pressure sensitivity are correlated with each other closely, if not equal. Good point. The, only equation that I showed, the right is delta P is a pressure difference change. The left is a stress change. Um, confining stress or confining stress change, confining pressure or confining stress changes, the rock property from lab testing view or palm view, but in the red, where the surrounding rock does not go anywhere. Of course, confining pressure or stress doesn't change, but uh, the pore pressure changes. Compaction of the rock due to the confining stress increase, then the increase of effective stress. On the other hand, pore pressure increase due to injection flow, such as fracturing, the effective stress decrease and it goes to negative after the pressure reach to the minimum stress. That's actually a very good point. We studied this phenomena. I think many people studied this phenomena uh, in depth. Uh, basically, uh, what uh, Peter mentioned is, on uh, one hand, you inject tons of fluid, uh, expand the rock, increase the uh, fluid pressure around the valve. On the other hand, we put the valve on drawdown, uh, you deplete, reduce the pressure, fluid pressure, uh, 
Um, so this uh, back and forth process, right? So how that uh, 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 cancel out each other or, or overweight each other. Simulations can answer that, can answer that question. We have studied this phenomena uh, in depth and constantly you will find out depending on the time, depending on the permeability of the, your uh, surrounding rock, um, tied to your completion as well, uh, engineer as well. Uh, this uh, leak off rate, this uh, prior dissipation after injection uh, can be rapid, can be slow. And uh, what we are talking about in this uh, uh, study is actually depletion uh, driven or, or drawdown driven. We are talk, talk about the literally beyond the initial injection stage. At, that, at this stage in this study, uh, most of stimulation induced uh, pop pressure change already gone. Okay, this primary from production. All right, those are fantastic questions. I have learned a, a lot actually from your questions, my, rather than from my study. <laughs> Thank you all for those questions. Uh, uh, Russell asked, uh, you mentioned the rock composition play important role. Definitely, fundamentally is rock. Did you consider rock composition in your analysis? Um, in our analysis, uh, we did a particular study for particular uh, field. Therefore, uh, we didn't expand the scope to many different rock types. But uh, I also mentioned a rock sample from my previous uh, uh, company, Heist Corporation, uh, where uh, the bucking sample is come from. So that is can be analog as well uh, to many of the fields you are working on. Um, so this this phenomenon, regardless, you have ten thousand psi and not. When people, as a rock mechanics guy, when the when I first saw this data, I it's just a slap on my face because I told them I don't believe uh, a compaction failure for unconventional rock. If you are telling me I can carry ten thousand psi on my shoulder. And then you are telling me internally, I collapsed at 2,300 PSI, 20% of that uh, value. That's just not logical. That's not the, uh, what I expected. But again, let's be humble, especially in front of mother of nature, in front of this, uh, this rock. Rock is a king. That's why geology, Molly, being a geologist, proud of yourself, proud of, of uh, myself too, uh, being a member of PSGD for, for very long. And fundamentally, we always start with the rock. But however, the key for the company, for any uh, organization is production and automated recovery, right? So as, a, as long as we connect these two, connect together, we get our keys. We get our money for the test, we get our, a uh, call, <laughs> which all the geologists want, uh, but often not uh, very uh, uh, readily available, as long as you can demonstrate the value. So that's all. Uh, thank you. As I mentioned, uh, all great question. Uh, if uh, any of you have further questions, feel free to send me this uh, email uh, address. Uh, including if you're interested in the uh, symposium, International Geomechanics Symposium. We're going to talk about a lot of rocks, a lot of uh, <laughs> fundamentally rock, uh, in situ stress, force, and natural factors. Uh, if uh, feel free to join us and have fun. And uh, let's, uh, let's bring the beauty of the rock mechanics, geomechanics. Uh, like I have said in my LinkedIn post, I'm so glad to meet the rock passionates, rock passionates um, from any society. We all share the same goal. Rock is beautiful. We should promote them. Thank you all. Thanks, Molly. Uh, thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thank you for answering all those great questions. And we have recorded this session and here in a, within the week should have it on our YouTube channel for any of you who want to watch it back and thank you so much, Dr. Ha. This was really awesome. Great talk. Thank you very, very much.
you are most welcome. And thanks, uh, uh, P PSGD, for this opportunity. I look forward uh, to many of you interacting with many of you as a president of AMA as well in the future. Thank you. Thank you. You all have a good afternoon. Thank you. Same to you.